we are extremely pleased to invite Professor Alan Mikhail to join us at Global Asia, Conversation with the Scholars at Duke University. I am Yuan Julian Chen, Environmental Humanities Fellow of the Global Asia Initiative and the Franklin Humanities Institute. Professor Mikhail is the Chase Family Professor of History and also the Chair of the Department of History at Yale University. A widely recognized historian of Middle Eastern history and global history, he has received multiple awards in the fields of Middle Eastern and environmental history. His 2019 book, Under Osman's Tree, The Ottoman Empire, Egypt, and Environmental History, received the book prize from the Ottoman and the Turkish Studies Association. He is also the recipient of Roger Owen Book Award from the Middle East Studies Association for his book, Nature and Empire in Ottoman Egypt and Environmental History. Uh, Professor Mikhail, the Ottoman Empire is an, an amazing chapter in world history, spanning three continents and over six centuries. Many people are fascinated by this history, especially its sweep military conquest, the clash of religions, and so forth. But you have chosen a very unique lens to study the Ottoman Empire, its environment. Can you please tell us why you chose this angle and what can environment history tell us about the Ottoman Empire, but the others cannot? Um, thanks, Yuan. You know, one could answer that question in several different ways. The most basic, I would say, as your own research shows and as that of, of many other scholars in environmental history show, you know, the environment is a basic facet of any society that we have to understand if we want to understand the politics, economy, society, history of any past place. So at that level, you know, there's nothing out of the ordinary to study the environmental history of the Ottoman Empire. That makes good sense, it's something we should do. But your question is pointing to the fact that not to paint too complete a picture, but that scholars in the past have not paid a lot of attention to the environmental history of the Ottoman Empire. There are some people who have made suggestions in that regard. We might say that people who have worked on taxation or land tenure or things like that were doing something related to environmental history, even if it wasn't called that. But environmental history qua environmental history is fairly new in Ottoman history, as you suggested. So I was attracted to it for the following reasons. It struck me as one of the ways that getting at basic structures in the way that economic history might, long durée processes, mm -hmm. things having to do with population, settlement, the change of life ways over time, these are, again, sort of base to any society. And, I, and the kind of historian that I am, I think, illuminate much more than, say, you know, the cultural history of a particular institution in a set of years, as important as that is, or story of a group of scholars or, or something like that. So not to take anything away from that kind of work, but I, I'm much more interested in kind of basic facets of society. And the engagement of people with their environment seems to me to be one of the ways of doing that. So that was important to me. It was a way of connecting the Ottoman Empire to other parts of the world. By its very nature, environmental history is transnational or global, whatever term one wants to use. And so that was appealing to me to think about how to bring the Middle East into conversations in global history in a real way. Right. Environmental history was a way of doing that, that that interested me. It was a way of talking about the empire relationally internal to the empire, so, so beyond global history, but of thinking about the relationship of different regions of the empire to each other. So, for example, you know, I'm interested in the way that food production in Egypt connects it to other parts of the empire, the capital in Istanbul, but also parts of North Africa. And, and places in greater Syria and things like that. And so if you follow those trajectories, you get a different view of the empire than a political story or a military story or something like that. Environmental history also 
was appealing to me in doing Ottoman history because it brought in different kinds of actors as well. So if we think that the vast majority of the people who lived in the Ottoman Empire for the vast majority of its 600 year history were peasant farmers of one kind or another, were agriculturalists, that is a very important thing to pay attention to, right? Beyond the political elite, beyond, you know, merchant classes and cities. Again, all important topics. But thinking of the vast majority, again, of, of the people who make up the society, environmental history offered a way of getting at some of those histories, right? So that seemed to me, again, to be very important and something that I was interested in doing. And beyond even just humans, right? It, it also allowed us to bring in animals as the key actors that they are in an agricultural landscape. That's something that I've been interested in and done work on. We could think of microbes. We could think of other non-human forces that make up empires. So for all of those reasons, environmental history struck me as an interesting, different, and yet absolutely central way of, of trying to understand a polity like the Ottoman Empire. Thank you for this wonderful introduction of why you're interested in environmental history and how this is a unique way to study the Ottoman history. So I'm thinking about your book on the Osman's tree. It's a very interesting book and you very craftily cited this foundation myth of the founding of the Ottoman Empire, the Osman's tree growing from the navel of Osman. Can you tell the general audience a little bit about this founding myth and how you relate this founding myth to the body of the Ottoman Empire as an organic whole? Sure. So, you know, states tell stories about themselves. And this is one of the stories that members of the Ottoman Empire, the, the ruling elite, said about themselves. And, and this is a story that, as best we know, the, the first evidence we have for it comes at the end of the the 15th century. So this is, you know, several centuries after the supposed founding of the Ottoman Empire, and we can debate about when the Ottoman Empire began. The idea is that Osman has a dream in which, as you said, a tree sprouts from his navel and covers the world. And this has been interpreted in, in multiple ways by Ottoman historians since the end of the 15th century, really. And the idea being that the, the shadow of the tree is the sovereignty of the Ottoman state, will therefore cover the earth. And I use this simply to sort of make the point that the idea of the land, the place of the Ottoman Empire, the fact of the tree itself, what the tree requires in terms of solar energy and of water and of soil and of nutrients, that those things were live and in the minds of at least the Ottoman writers who were putting this together at the end of the 15th century. And that that offers us a way into thinking about the relationship of Ottoman sovereignty and the environment. So that's essentially a, a kind of nice opening device to get into this other longer history that I talk about in the book that departs from that um, origin story. Thank you for the introduction. So this is an um, empire that has spanned the three continents with very different ecosystems in its different regions in, across the three continents. So can you tell us about the overall resource geography of Ottoman Empire, where the uh, sultans extracted a certain materials? Uh, where, did the, where did the material came from? How they were transported to Istanbul or are the strategic sites within the empire? Yeah, so as you say, the territory of the empire is vast and varied. And, you know, the potentials for writing different kinds of environmental histories for different kinds of environments is a large one in Ottoman history. And so, you know, we've just begun to scratch the surface of the things that, that we could do. So, you know, within the, the borders of the empire, if we're thinking at its maximal, you know, there are mountain ranges, mm -hmm. there are river watersheds, there are obviously coastlines, there are deserts, there are semi-arid regions, there are many cities, there are hills and, and scrub vegetation. There are all kinds of different environments within the Ottoman Empire. So 
there, there are areas of thick forest, for example, in Southern Anatolia. So, you know, one of the arguments that I put forward in Under Osman's Street, the book you just mentioned, is that one of the ways that the empire is able to survive and project its legitimacy, sovereignty, power is in its ability to balance various different resources within the empire, right? So if we think of wood that I just mentioned, these forests in Southern Anatolia, there are also forests in you know, what is today Lebanon and Syria. Those areas were managed very strategically as one of the main sources of wood for the empire. Wood essential for shipbuilding, of course. Yes. Um, but the management of those areas becomes a matter of imperial governance. And there are many stories one could tell about that. Similarly, grain production, right, is something that the empire has to manage, moving food from areas of plenty to areas of want. We could think about environmental labor, right? You know, I and others have talked about various, quote unquote, infrastructural projects that the Ottomans undertake in various periods of their history that involve the movement of human laborers and sometimes animal laborers as well from one part of the empire to the other. So all of these are, are resources that have to be actively managed. You know, to answer your question, perhaps in a slightly different way, John McNeil, the environmental historian, has made the observation about the Middle East. He's made many observations about the Middle East, but, but a couple that I think are salient here. One is that as a region, the Middle East is the region with many coastlines, okay? that allow the vast majority of the population to be fairly close to a coastline. I think he compares it to Southeast Asia and maybe the Caribbean as comparable. You know, interestingly, those regions are largely archipelagos of various kinds in a way that the Middle East is not. That's interesting. It has several very large river systems, the Nile, the Tigris, Euphrates, uh, but not a ton of smaller rivers. And so that creates the term that he uses is a pelagic geography of waterways and lands being intermixed in, in, in very, very close proximity to one another. Um, a lot of the seas around the Middle East are not rich in fish stocks. The Black Sea is, but comparatively, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean are not. So that has interesting implications for food supply and for husbandry practices in the Middle East. And then the final thing that I'll just say on this point is the relationship between settlement and pastoralism is an, a very old theme yes. um, in the history of the Middle East, the history of several other places, global regions of the world. But the Middle East is interesting in this regard in that because you don't, apart from the few exceptions that I mentioned, you don't have vast swaths of forest or even grassland. So the relationship between settled communities and pastoralists is one of push and pull always in the history of, of the Middle East. I mean, this is the quintessential statement of this is Ibn Khazun, right? Of um, uh, the, the way he describes the rise and fall of, of states. So one final thing, even though I said I would finish on that previous point is the story of energy in the Middle East. Is that, again, a point that McNeil makes in this essay on the environmental history of the Middle East is that before the age of oil, obviously that's a, a very important story related to the history of the Middle East and energy. You don't have massive supplies of, of forest land again for charcoal. And so most of the energy is human and animal energy. And so that shapes the history of the Middle East in very particular ways. Thank you. Actually, I want to pick up on what you just mentioned about the animal labor. And now that you brought up again, so I would like to follow up on that. So you have another book specifically dedicated to your animal in Ottoman, especially animal in Ottoman Egypt. So can you tell us a little bit about the roles of animals or different types of animals in different localities in the Ottoman Empire and in different phases of its history? The first set of animals that I focus on in the book are along the lines that we've been discussing already are domesticated laboring agricultural animals. So oxen, donkeys, some horses. These are animals used in agricultural to pull plows, to turn water wheels, to crush grains, etc. 
these are animals that are sometimes used for food production, right? Yogurt, milk. Interestingly, the Middle East and Northern Europe are regions of the world in which lactose toleration seems to have been a trait that was developed. So that points to a very close interaction between humans and, and animals and, and dairy products, of course. So in an agricultural world in which the labor demands are high, animals provide power that can't be provided in any other way. And that makes them key to understanding an agricultural realm. Again, if we think that the vast majority of people who lived in the Ottoman Empire were related to agriculture, either directly or indirectly, then it becomes quite important to think about what is the shape of the power regime of the countryside? How do things come to market? And animals are key in all of those realms. We see that in, for example, the amount of money that is wrapped up in animals, right? So in estate inventories and probate records, one of the largest forms of capital in the early modern countryside in the Ottoman Empire was wrapped up in animals. People, technically, it's a complicated story, couldn't own land in the Ottoman Empire. Sometimes they did, not really, but in a world in which land is basically not a form of property, animals become one of the most important forms of property. And so you see very complicated economic relationships built around the ownership of animals. People can own shares in, animal, in a, one particular animal, a group of people. You can buy futures on an animal's offspring, things like that. So again, they're wrapped up in all of these very complicated economic and social relationships. And so you know, paying attention to that is quite important. You know, there are many other kinds of animals in the Ottoman world. One that I focus on in my book is our dogs. It's a complicated story. <laughs> well, one of the things I'm interested in is the use of dogs in much the same way that pigs were used in North American cities in the 19th century, that they served a public health and a public hygiene and a sanitation function of eating garbage, chasing out vermin, those kinds of things. And you have accounts of Ottoman authorities in various cities, Cairo and Istanbul being some of the most important, of putting out food and water for dogs and of actually punishing people who committed violence against dogs. And this flies in the face of a kind of popular understanding that dogs are considered ritually impure in Muslim societies. And so I trace the evolution of that idea from the time of the prophet to the present, really and to show how that's changed over time. That's a much more complicated story than just the story of dogs are bad in Islam. And then the other group of animals that I discuss in the book are charismatic megafauna. So these are your basic zoo animal, you know, elephants and giraffes, the big ticket items. And I'm interested there in thinking about the trade in these animals that's largely an Indian Ocean trade from South Asia and other places east of the Ottoman Empire to the Ottoman Empire. And then the roles those animals play in ideas of kingship and sovereignty in the Ottoman Empire. And the last bit of that book is interested in the early development of zoos in the Ottoman Empire. And I spend a good deal of a chapter on the Cairo Zoological Garden. Thank you. I know there is one type of animal you didn't mention in your book, but you, at least one of your articles, that is horse. So can you tell us about the place of horse in the Ottoman Empire? And I assume it must be very prominent given this is a military empire, right? Yes, right. In an agricultural realm, horses were quite expensive for most commoners to possess. Sometimes they did. But you're right to point to the military uses of Horses. So, so the state is very interested in the monopolization of horses in the empire. And it's not just for military purposes, it's also for communication. And, you know, one of my students wrote a dissertation that in part discussed the role of horses in the post system in the Ottoman Empire. So again, a kind of imperial project of communication in which horses play a key role. But they were not ubiquitous across the Ottoman realms as they were in other places. I see. Since you talk about communication, transportation, and you also talk about the rivers, so I want to go back to the point that you mentioned in two answers before that. So you mentioned the diversity of 
waters in the Ottoman Empire. You mentioned the Nile, you mentioned the Red Sea, the Mediterranean, and the canals. So given the diversity of different types of water systems in the Ottoman Empire, how did the empire see the waters in its resource geography, and how did they manage the different types of waters for its benefit? You know, obviously river systems and seas are very, very different, right? There's obviously a military component to this story. So, you know, historians have worked on the history of the Ottoman Navy in interesting ways and have talked about the monopolization of wood resources for shipbuilding, for example, as part of that story. In terms of riverine systems across the empire, one of the arguments I, I make is that irrigation and water resources were managed at the local level in coordination with the empire. And that this was a kind of symbiotic relationship between the empire, imperial authorities uh, dispatched to Iraq or Egypt, and the agriculturists who lived on those canals and on the river. It goes back and forth. So there are some infrastructural projects, for example, that have um, imperial consequences. So a large dam, a large embankment that can't be fixed at the local level. The resources are simply not there. To fix something like that, you need the coordinating power, the money of something like an imperial, an imperial formation like the Ottoman Empire. And so you will see examples of locals petitioning the Ottoman Empire to say that you know, a large dam in our area has collapsed. And this dam, you know, feeds all of these canals that grows all of this food. Some of this food is going to be sent very far away from here in our rural location in Egypt to feed stomachs in Istanbul and in Libya and in parts of Anatolia. And so, you know, if you want to maintain this food supply, you need to make it possible for us to fix this dam. And so there's a kind of back and forth about prices and labor and who's going to undertake it and who will be responsible and this and that. But it is this relationship of the imperial and the local to try to figure out how to fix the situation that, of course, serves the local population immediately, but also has imperial consequences. You know, so that's one version of it. Another version of it is groups of peasants will, amongst themselves, figure out how best to manage a canal, right? And who is responsible for coming up with the resources? Who is responsible if it breaks? Who gets the benefit from it? And, you know, there's a whole schedule of who gets water at what time for how long of a period, you know, that can be very complicated arrangements. So, you know, water management, to answer your question directly, is a very good lens, I think, for thinking about all of these different scales of political actors the very local, the kind of regional or provincial, and then the imperial. And to think of those actors also in other parts of the empire and how they're implicated in water management. So that was one of the reasons I was interested and others are interested in water management, because it's so key for so much that's going on in the empire. Thank you so much. Since we have some time, I want to ask you another set of questions, and that is about the Anthropocene. So I know you have written about it, and you're part of that debate, and you obviously have your own take on it, which is related to enlightenment. Can you tell us why you relate an Anthropocene to enlightenment? So to be clear, I don't advocate in that article for any one periodization over another. The point I try to make in that article is that there are multiple periodizations on offer, right? There's the sort of Rudiman ancient Anthropocene version of things, you know, that, that it was rice cultivation in China that began the Anthropocene. There's the kind of 1780s uh, industrialization steam engine story, that that's when it begins. There's the 1945, you know, once there is a, a nuclear signifier that that's when it begins. Some have suggested various other dates. Uh, my point in thinking in that article, and the reason I call it the Enlightenment Anthropocene, is to make the argument that the idea of the Anthropocene, the idea of a periodization in which humans are 
designated as the primary geophysical actors. Humans are designated as a geophysical force. Mm -hmm. I'll say what's good about that in a second, but let me say the critique first. I read that as a kind of green, eco-inflected version of the age of man, right? In a very literal sense, of course. But the idea that human agency, human ability to shape the natural world is the primary motor of history, right? And that is very much an enlightenment idea. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of, you know, man as the progenitor of rights, politics, of thought, of rationality, of invention, all of these things. It is an inheritance of the Enlightenment. And there's much that's good about that, that obviously we all exist in and, and can't live without. But it strikes me that saying that we've come up with a new paradigm of periodizing world history, the Anthropocene, is a little unradical in the sense, it's not as radical as it's made out to be, right? If we accept a 17... 80s, you know, end of the 18th century kind of periodization. That's exactly the periodization of the Enlightenment, right? And the way that people talk about the Anthropocene is very much one of modernization and modernity, eco-inflected and accusatory of humans, that we put all this CO2 in, into the atmosphere, but nevertheless, right? And 1945 is similarly, you know, a pretty traditional breaking point in world history for a lot of good reasons. But what is added by, you know, now calling this thing the Anthropocene? It strikes me that, that, not, that not a lot is added. So the, what, is, what is good about it is putting the onus on humans, right? That we are the ones who mess things up, as it were. And I accept that. And obviously, I think that's right. There's a much more radical potential, though, to think about history beyond the human, right? Not just animal history or environmental history, but all kinds of things that various historians interested in environmental topics have discussed, right? People have talking about thinking about planetary history in an interesting kind of way, or obviously climate, right? Thinking of other repositories for agency in history, right? The, the Anthropocene does not help us to get past the human in that way. It in a way, it pretends to be radical in a way that I think it's not. And, and that's the kind of critique that I want to put forward in that essay. I see. Thank you for this explanation of your view on that. I wonder if you think the current effort of the Anthropocene Working Group to try to pinpoint a golden spike in geology yeah. to trying to identify... I mean, despite everything I said, I'm all for this work for all kinds of reasons. I, I'm always glad to see historians in conversation with climatologists and social scientists and pollen core experts and all these things. I think that's a very, very useful thing. I think the debate about the Anthropocene is quite generative and interesting. That's part of the reason that I spent some time with it. You know, I, I think saying that there is a breaking point, right? A, a single year in geological time, there's no such thing as a single year, right? Even on the order of 5,000 years is a minute blip in geological time. So at that level, human history, maybe we're 100,000 years, you know, identifiably as humans on this earth, earth. Even that is in some ways a blip in geological time. So I think we can keep both ideas in mind that in some ways, it's an impossible exercise, let's say, to try to identify the point at which the Anthropocene begins. And yet the process of doing that is highly generative, interesting, and raises all kinds of questions that I think we should be grappling with as historians. And I think has been generative for the historical profession and its relationship to other professions, et cetera. So, you know, so I hope that work will continue. It will continue to generate debate. So that's a good, always a good thing. Yeah, thank you. I totally agree with you that it definitely has generated a lot of good scholarship in so many disciplines. So in that way, it is a very productive term to keep people thinking about history in different ways. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Alan. All right. Thank you, Yuan.
Bye. Be in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.